don't need you to cover up my speech, man. Put it underneath. Put it underneath. Because I just typed that this morning. Everybody, we're about to start. We're about to start. Everybody, we're about to start. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Have you ever heard a song that moves you to a point where you just want to tell all your friends about it? Well, that's the type of feeling you get when you experience and listening to gospel music. Hi, I am Andrea Billings, the FIT Gospel Choir current president. And I want to share a few words with you about gospel music and how it plays a part in history and diversity. Gospel is defined as sharing the good news. Africa, and it was originated in the African-American churches and it's a way to share positive messages and uplift individuals during trials and tribulations. Throughout history, it has evolved and changed to different genres of gospel music. So however, the message still remains the same. I would like for everyone to stand as we sing the National Negro Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing by the great James Will Johnson.
Let's please give a hand for the FIT Gospel Choir. Good afternoon. On behalf of Dr. Joyce F. Brown, President of the Fashion Institute of Technology and the Black History Month uh, Planning Committee, I would like to welcome you to the opening ceremony to our celebration of Black History Month. My name is Dr. Ron Milan. I'm the Chief Diversity Officer at this college, and I, it gives me pleasure to be here with you today. February 1st marks the beginning of Black History Month, where each, where Americans set aside time to reflect on the historical contributions that people of African American descent have made to this country. While not everyone agrees with the concept of Black History Month, I feel that it is a good thing for several reasons. But first, before I go into those reasons, let me talk a little bit about the history of Black History Month, also called African American History Month. This event was originally a week. Um, it was Negro History Week in 1926 and it became a celebration piece um, celebrating the birthday of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. Carter Woodson, a Harvard trained historian, created the Negro History Week. In 1976, President Gerald R. Ford, during the, the bicentennial celebration, decided it should be an entire month and that way we can honor the often neglected accomplishments of black Americans um, in our history. Now, as I mentioned before earlier, there was some, um, some de debate about Black History Month. Black History Month been a um, subject of criticism for both blacks and other races. Some argue that it's unfair to create an entire month for a single group. Others contend that one month is not enough time but despite these ob objections, I believe that there is a good reason to have this celebration and remembering the contributions that so many people have made over the history of this country. First of all, celebrating black history honors the historical leaders of the black community. This video that you just saw is an example of the, of the just a glimpse actually, of the many people that have put, sacrificed so much to make a difference in this country. Second, celebrating helps us, especially for the young people, to be better stewards of, of the privileges that we have gained. From the work of the civil rights freedom fighters to the, to the slaves who suffered 400 years of bondage. It is not just memorizing dates or people, it is reflecting and in, internalizing the accomplishments of what people have done. The third point, celebrating provides us an opportunity to highlight the best of black history and of culture. Unfortunately, we see so many negative images of poverty rates, incarceration, high school dropout rates, and also we see people um, who are stars in the sports and TV, reality TV shows, and we need to change that paradigm a bit because this is not a reflection of, the, of a culture of success and of struggle. The fourth, celebrating black history creates awareness. And I wanted to say one real quick thing. When I was in eighth grade, I remember that I had a social studies class where the teacher asked the class, what, is, what does NAACP mean? I was the only black in the class, so of course, who did he look at right at me? And I did not know. Um, so I was somewhat embarrassed, but I made it a goal since that time to make sure that I knew that and then some. It gives us the opportunity, the awareness to make us as a better people. And the fifth point, celebrating reminds us all that black history is our history. It pains me to see when people overlook black history and also Hispanic history, Asian history, Europe, European history, and Native American history because it really belongs, all of this belongs to all of us. It's all a part of our history. Black history draws people from every race into the grand and diverse story of this nation. And that is why we are here today. We are here to remember, we are here to honor, we are here to celebrate, and we are here to live the dream. And at this time, it gives me pleasure to ask Dr. Giacomo Oliva, Vice President of Academic Affairs, who will introduce our keynote speaker today. Thank you.
Thank you, Ron. I'm delighted today to welcome today's speaker, H. Carl McCall, who is chairman of the State University of New York Board of Trustees. Mr. McCall first joined the board as a board member in 2007 and has served as chairman since 2011. Carl has had a distinguished career as a public servant. He has served three terms as a New York State Senator representing the Upper Manhattan District of New York City, as an ambassador to the United Nations, as a commissioner of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and as commissioner of the New York State Division of Human Rights. In addition, he has served for nine years as Comptroller for the State of New York. Mr. McCall has also been a strong leader and passionate advocate for public education, serving as president of the New York City Board of Education and setting policy for the nation's largest school system, and as chairman of the Public Higher Education Conference Board, a coalition of 14 member organizations that support a strong and vibrant public education system here in the state of New York. Educated at Dartmouth, Andover Newton Theological Seminary and the University of Edinburgh, and a recipient of nine honorary doctorates. We are indeed honored to have him share his remarks with us this afternoon. Please join us in welcoming H. Carl McCall to FIT. Dr. Jack, thank you for that introduction, and thank you for welcoming me, me to FIT. That's very odd. I'm, I spend a lot of time here, but it's nice to be welcomed anyway. <laughs> it's really good to be here and uh, to have an opportunity to share uh, some thoughts with you on this great occasion. I just want to say that it's a pleasure to be here representing the board of the State University of New York. You know, FIT, of course, is part of the State University of New York. We have 64 campuses uh, um, that make up the largest public higher education system in the country. But uh, don't tell anybody, but I think this is the best of those 64 campuses. You know? uh, <clears throat> I only say that when I'm here. <laughs> okay. But it's a great honor that we are educating some 465,000 students in this state. So I understand that the theme of your um, program uh, during this month is going to be migration. And to talk not so much about where we are now, but how did we get here? How did we have the collection of black African Americans here in New York? And it's important to know our history because unless you know where you came from, you really can't make real plans about where you're going from here. And so it's important to know how we all got here, what we went through, what the African-American community went through. And you know, it all started in Africa. That's where we came from. But, but we moved from there, or we were moved from there. Between the 16th and 19th century, more than 25 million African people were forcibly enslaved and transported around the world to provide cheap labor for various global economies. The vast majority of those people were enslaved and transported in the uh, transatlantic slave trade, where people from Central and Western Africa had been sold by other West Africans to Western European, or they were captured directly by slave traders who raided these co coastal communities. African slaves were sold to work on coffee, tobacco, cocoa, and other agricultural products, and even in terms of skilled trades to help the economies of the world. The major Atlantic slave trading nations uh, were uh, the Spanish, the French, the British, other countries came together to see this great pool of labor, and that pool of labor was transported to help their economies. In the middle of the uh, 17th century, slavery had hardened as a racial caste. People who were slaves wherever they want, went. They, their children, their families had no rights whatsoever. They became property, they became goods, they were sold like other commodities. Of the 25 million slaves captured, 12 million were destined from the Atlantic, that means where we are, 
six million were destined for Asian slave market, and seven million stayed in Africa to help other white traders in that country. The transatlantic slave trade resulted in a vast, as yet still unknown, a loss of life. It's estimated that of the 25 million people who were transported from Africa, at least 10 million died on the way, or they died in, in their new locations. And this transatlantic uh, slave trade contributed to the development of what we know as the African diaspora. The African diaspora refers to the worldwide collection of communities descended from African people. The, the diaspora is most readily understood as a collection of people of African origin living outside of the continent. De irrespective of their citizenship or nationality, there is a community of people who have come from Africa, who are settled in other parts of the world, and who recognize their roots, recognize where they come from, and they represent the, the diaspora. <laughs> What about, how did they all get to the United States? Most of the trade, the slaves who came to this continent, first came to Brazil and to the uh, Caribbean countries. And from there, they moved to the southern part of the United States. And that's where they were for over 200 years. But then something happened uh, about for all black folks who were concentrated in the south. There was something called the Great Migration when they left the South and came to northern communities. The migration was the movement of some six million African Americans out of the rural southern United States to the urban Northeast, the Midwest, and the West. All this occurred between 1960, 1960 and 1970. Six million people moved during that period out of the South to other parts of the country. In every US census prior to 1910, more than 90% of the African American population lived in the, Amer in the American South. In 1900, only one fifth of African Americans living in the South were living in the urban North. By the end of the Great Migration, only 50% of African Americans remained in the South. So 50% of African Americans remained in the South 50% were scattered throughout the Northeast, the Midwest. The Great Migration was one of the largest and most rapid mass uh, internal movements in history. In sheer numbers, it outranks the migration of any other ethnic group, Italians, Irish, or Jews, or Poles to the United States. So more African Americans moved from the South to the North than all other groups that came to the United States from Europe and other countries. And of course, the primary factors of the immigration, of the migration among Southern African Americans was segregation, racism, and the treatment that blacks experienced in the South. In the South, blacks were harshly treated and were not expected to be anything other than a slave. There were also widespread lynchings. Nearly 4,500 African Americans were lynched between 1882 and 1948. So for blacks living in the South, it was dangerous, it was difficult, it was unhealthy, it was harmful. And blacks left the South. Now people wonder about that. Why, what was it about the South? that made so many people want to live. What was life like in the segregated Jim Crow South? And unless you've really experienced it, it's hard to understand how bad it was. I had my one experience in the South. It was very memorable, never forget it. What happened was uh, I'm from the North. I lived in Boston. I knew about segregation. Boston wasn't the great equitable city, the great liberal city that it's made out to be, but at least it wasn't the South. So most of what I knew about segregation and Jim Crow and outright racism, I read about, never experienced it. However, 
After I graduated in, from college in 1962, I was in the ROTC. That meant that I now had to spend some time in the service. And I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army, and I was sent to Fort Benning in Georgia. It's in a town called Albany, not Albany as we know it, they call it Albany there. So I now have, have never been south before, I'm leaving Boston, went to school in New Hampshire, and now I'm going down south. What's it going to be like? It's quite interesting. I got on a plane, the first time I'd ever been on a plane, and I sat next to another young fellow who had graduated from Yale. He was white, and he was also going into the Army, and he was going to be stationed at Fort Benning. So we flew to Albany, Georgia together, got to know one another, talked about our experiences in Ivy League colleges. And when we landed, uh, the plane was late, but we got a taxi and it said that they would take us to the bus terminal in Albany where we could then get a bus to go for another hour ride out to Fort Benning. So when we got to the bus terminal, the last bus left. It was now about 12 midnight and the next bus wasn't coming until six o'clock in the morning. And so there we were, but there was a bus station and a very nice terminal and a, and a restaurant in the terminal. So we walked in and it was great. It was nice and clean and warm and uh, empty. Nobody was there, but there was a counter where there was a man behind the counter. So we went over to the counter, I was gonna get some tea or something else. And what was really interesting was this man's attitude toward me. It wasn't harsh, it wasn't like, what are you doing here? It was like, oh, well, you should know better. You should be in here asking for tea. I said, why? He said, this is the white bus terminal. We can't serve you tea. So that was my first thing. Here I am, a soldier, an officer in the United States Army, and I'm in a bus terminal, and this white guy tells me he can't serve me tea because I'm black. I just didn't understand it. He said, but if you want tea, go around the back. So I went out, and attached to the bus terminal was another little shack. And in there, there were about a dozen black people. There was a little bench, other people on the floor. And this was the difference. This clean, comfortable waiting room, entirely empty, but outside, and I didn't even see the sign that said black only, or it said colored, I guess, but that's where I had to go. And as soon as I got in this little room, a window went up, and the fellow who was on the counter on the other side opens the window, <laughs> and he says to me, now I can give you your tea. <laughs> so, I mean, it was, just humiliating and just so difficult to understand the lack of humanity. And this was the South. This was a place where if you were black, you went to this little room in the back where somebody will give you something through a window. And if you're white, you've got all the rest of these facilities available to you. And that was my experience in the South. And that's why people left the South. And that's why they came north. And they came north and they made a difference. Life was different. And the people who came north didn't forget about where they came from. And they were therefore involved in one of the greatest movements we've seen in this country, the civil rights movement, that changed all of that. Completely changed it. So much so that in the last election, you have a black woman running to be the governor of Georgia. I can tell you this. <clears throat> the fellow who wouldn't serve me tea never thought that would happen. But now that we're here, what we have to figure out is what we do. Now that we're here, what are the next steps? As we think about migration, we think about moving, we think about migration not in terms of moving to other places, but moving the conditions that all of us suffer, that all of us live with. And that's the responsibility we have today. And there are two things that I believe will have made the difference in the past and will make the difference in the future. 
And those two things, as I think about my own life and the changes that I went through, there are two things that make a difference, education and politics. Education is transformational. Why are you here today? You're here today because you had a good education and you're committed to continuing that education. That's what it meant for me. I was raised by my mother. She raised me and six, my five sisters, all by herself. She couldn't give us much in terms of material things, but she gave us an understanding that the most important thing we could do is to get a good education. You know how my mother explained education? She said it's like a sledgehammer. It'll knock down anything anybody ever puts in front of you. And that's what education meant for me. And I was that lucky I was able to get a good free education. And when I finished my education, I learned something even then about the continuing racism, discrimination, bias that people have toward people who are black. Because having received a good education, I wanted to give back. I wanted to be a teacher. So after graduating from Dartmouth, after I'd spent my little time in the Army, I come back to New York, to Boston, and I want to teach. So I go down to the, what was called the school committee for the city of Boston to present myself and to apply for a job. And I walked in, and the person looked down on the first floor, the receiving area, asked me what I wanted, and I told her I'd come to apply for a job. She gave me an application to fill out, and she told me to wait. And after I filled out the application, she sent me upstairs to see Miss Fitzgerald. Miss Fitzgerald was in charge of all recruitment and placement for the, New York, for the Boston Public Schools. And when I walked in the room, Miss Fitzgerald jumped up and said, you're just what we need for Jamaica Plain High School. You're big and you can keep order. Jamaica Plain High School had just become a mostly black high school. And the attitude of this woman, who was responsible for placing people in public schools of Boston, believed that all of these children needed was somebody big who could keep them orderly. And at that point, I decided that I was going to be involved in education, not necessarily as a teacher, but in setting educational policy to change that attitude, to change that bigotry, to get people in education to understand that every child, every student has worth, has value, and that we've got to support them and uplift them and believe in them and help them to believe in themselves. And that's what I <clears throat> <laughs> and that's what I've tried to do with my career and came to New York which is a place of great opportunity I could never do in Boston in uh, Boston what I was able to do in New York the opportunities in New York are, are boundless and you all know that and you're all trying to take advantage of it and that's why I got involved and became the president of the New York City Board of Education and now my commitment to the State University of New York, but it's all about that belief in students and their value and how we must be supportive of them. So education is important. We all have to make sure it is affordable. We have to make sure it's accessible. We have to make sure it's quality. That's what we try to do at SUNY, and that's what we have to do with our entire educational system here in the United States. The second thing that moves us forward is politics. Now, some people don't want to have anything to do with politics. They think it's dirty and rotten, and that's true. But that's how get things get done. That is how things get done. And you get in it, and you clean it up, and you try to change it, but it is what can make a difference. And given the things that I had done, I recognized that uh, the bottom line, in terms of moving forward the things that were important, we had to be involved in politics. And believe me, when we get involved, it makes a difference. The problem we've had is that here in the United States, this so-called progressive nation, in presidential elections, only 50% of the people bother to come out and vote. So can you really complain about what happens if you don't participate and you don't vote? But guess what? That's changing. 
And sometimes bad things have to happen to make people wake up and realize that they've got to be involved. And a bad thing happened, and I think you know his name. <laughs> but what that did is encourage people to say, well, you know, we, we allowed this to happen, so we've got to change. And these last midterm elections, look at the difference. Look what happened. People came out and voted and made a difference. And young people in particular, students, I was so glad to see people right here at FIT registering, registering to vote. And I, it was good to see people come out and vote. And last night, if you saw the State of the Union, wasn't it wonderful to see all those women dressed in white? All those women in white. 131 women in the Congress. And guess what? They didn't all stand up and clap. They knew they were there to send a signal. And when that fellow said that, you know, we've employed all the new people, have now jobs, I'm responsible for creating jobs, and all those women stood up and said, yes, you're, I'm, you're responsible for the job I have right here in Congress. So they made a difference young people, women, and that's where we go from here. So black history is about achievement. It's about the future. It's about how we form coalitions. We can't do it alone. Working with women, working with other people, young people, old people, people coming together and recognizing that America is what it is because of the contribution of so many people. And we've got to continue to be sure that everyone has an opportunity to contribute. Because when we allow people to contribute, things get better, things change, and we begin to live out the reality of the American dream. So black history is about American history. It's about one of the many groups that came to America, made a difference in America, overcame great barriers in America, but people who still believe in America and who still believe that this is a land of great opportunity, of great progress, and great hope. Black people have contributed to that, and let's hope we can continue to do so. Thank you. Let's give one more hand to Mr. Thomas. Now, uh, when Mr. McCaw stepped down, he asked me, do we have any questions? And I said, it wasn't set up that way, but I actually have a question for him. Um, he's a very dear uh, person and I uh, admire him so much. Um, we were talking about migrations and we're talking about the importance of education and politics. Just tell us one thing about, what, let's make a prediction. What do you see happening in the next two years?
at, at this time, I'd like to say thank you um, for coming. Um, throughout the month, we have events um, um, scheduled for Black History Month. There are posters throughout the campus. There will be email announcements. Um, and I'd like to give special thanks to some people that made this all possible. Dr. Brown, um, the President's Diversity Council, the Office of Educational Opportunity Programs, the Department of Student Life, the Student Government Association, the UCE of FIT, and the Black History Month Committee. So please look for the programs that we have um, posted for the month. Tonight we have a panel discussion by, by Bragg, um, which is diversity in a retail industry. It will be in this room starting at 5 o'clock. Again, thank you for coming um, and have a wonderful day.